Hello, everyone. My name is Jay Rudell. I am, I will be uh, conducting a bite sized PD concerning AVID, intentionally using AVID and Wicker strategies. Okay. And today we're going to talk about infusing your lessons with a little bit of a twist, is what I call it, um, using the AVID uh, Wicker, which we're going to talk a little bit more um, here in a few moments. Um, okay. Hit record. That's great. We're, we're on target now. So again, a couple of our, uh, development or professional development norms for canyons is be committed, responsible, respectful, and always please be safe and take care of your needs. Um, well, you don't need that today. We are going to be hanging out in the blue areas of the MTSS. Okay. We're going to be talking a lot of academic aspects of things. How does Wicker work within your behavior structures as well? And we're going to talk about going into depth and a, a lot of rigor that is associated with those AVID strategies. Um, the learning intentions go today as I'm learning about AVID strategies and how these strategies engage student learning. And I know when I am successful as far as the success criteria goes, if we can complete four or five worker strategies in a single lesson, that is awesome. And that's our goal is to have teachers wickerize their lessons so they're hitting four out of five of these to in increase the rigor and the student engagement, okay? Also a uh, success criteria, when you start thinking about intentionally using or infusing these AVID strategies in the lessons, it really goes a long way um, for student engagement and rigor as well. So those two, once you start seeing that, you know you've been successful with this professional development. I look at AVID as a twist. Um, I think of it as a twist of lemon, to be quite honest with you. Twists of lemon usually taste better with everything. Diet Coke, Coke, doesn't matter. Um, Coke's great by itself just like all the teachers are, but how do we infuse a little bit of rigor and student engagement into every lesson so the kids are getting as much out of this development or out of their lessons as possible? And so I always refer to it as the avid twist. Um, and I think it's, I don't wanna change anything about your lessons. I just want you to give it a little bit of a twist when we start thinking about infusing these AVID strategies. Um, so anyways, there's a, a, here's a twist and hopefully I'll be able to uh, show you these strategies where you can get a lot of bang for your buck with a little bit of a twist. This is what we call an AVID one pager. Um, this is a little bit about me. Um, this builds student uh, relational capacity. Um, you can do this with almost any type of project. Um, it really puts the uh, onus on the kid to explain what do they know by giving them basically a one pager and giving them uh, parameters in which to use that one pager. I work with Glacier Hills fifth grade team. They did a fantastic job with their uh, civil rights one pager. I'll give a quick shout out to Mallory Record from Jordan High. She did a, a one pager. Uh, with her geography class that were just fantastic. Um, and she was proud of it, but I think the kids were even more proud of it because it's totally on them. It's totally how they would go about explaining their ideas. And so this is a quick one for me down at the bottom. You can't see because my, my radio face is right there. Um, is I, I love music, uh, all sorts of music. Doesn't matter what it is. It's always pretty interesting to me, no matter what type of music is. Up at the top left, I love the ocean. I love being a part of uh, scuba diving and ocean and surfing and all those things. I'm a former high school basketball coach in Colorado for about 10 years. And I love to play golf, although it's been a rough golfing winter uh, here in Utah. 
Man, long winner. Top right, a couple of my favorite things. I like to read and uh, I love killer whales, dolphins, whales, the cetaceans of the world. Um, so I, I kind of do a lot of research and have fun reading uh, those types of books. Down on the right-hand corner, I have uh, the most important person in my life, uh, married up which is always good. If you haven't married up, you might want to think about it. Um, that's my wife, Natalie, and uh, our lovely puppy, Finn. Um, I don't know which which one she loves more, me or the, the dog, but uh, the reality is we all have to get along with the puppy now. I do have two kids. They're up for adoption. They're 20 and 21. I wish I'd leave my house. Uh, I don't show them the pictures because they're not, they kind of lost that cuteness factor, but... Uh, if you want to take them in, I'd be more than happy to help you out with that. So uh, they're two good kids, but man, please leave my house. Ugh. All right, let's get started here. Um, what is Avid? For those of you who are new to Avid, this is kind of, we're going to kind of go over that real quick. What is Wicker slash Wiser? And we're going to go briefly into what we call relational capacity, rigor, and engagement. Um, those three things are very important to the Avid uh uh, strategies, and you'll see them in everything that we do um, concerning Avid for the most part. Also, I'm going to show you the, the Wicker walkthrough template that will kind of break down things for you when it comes to actually understanding what do these activities mean and how do we infuse them into our lessons. So we're going to get started with that right away. But first of all, let me move my screen over here so we can see a little bit better. Um, AVID is uh, Advancement via Individual Determination. It started back in 1980, so they've been going at this for about 43 years. It is a system. It is not a program. And the system is basically improving teacher effectiveness, again, by using a little bit of that twist. Okay, it is designed for all kids to be career and college ready. And that is the focus of AVID is that all kids, doesn't matter where you come from, you will be ready for college and career. Okay, so that gives you a brief overview of what AVID is. Um, there is an AVID elective class that deals solely with a whole other aspect of AVID that I'm not going to get into. But I do want to um, briefly share what does that actually mean, uh, AVID, in, in its entirety. What's it? The Wicker model or the Wiser model for some of us, um, it's basically writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. What does that usually mean? It usually means we're going to have rigor and engagement with a lot of relational capacity as well for kids, especially in today's kids. Kids, today's kids, the relational capacity component is very key as well. Okay. So I want you to keep those two things in mind that everything that we do is looking for more rigor, more engagement, more relational capacity. Okay, but for our purposes today, we're going to focus on rigor and engagement for the most part. If we can intentionally use four out of the five strategies in each lesson, that would be awesome. So let's start talking about the Wicker walkthrough. I'm going to show you it in, in, in its entirety. There it is. It looks very cumbersome, but the reality is it really isn't because we break it down into five different sections, which is writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. And the first thing we're going to talk about is writing and how do we infuse writing into the actual process of AVID. Now, if you look down this, there's pre-writing activities, quick writes, time uh, timed writes, learning logs, graphic organizers for the writing process. And then down here's the, the big, one of the big staples of AVID is focus note taking. I am not saying you have to take, give notes one way or the other. I personally do Cornell notes. I work with Glacier Hills third grade team to do two column notes for them. As long as you're going through the process of focus note taking, and all of the phases, it really doesn't matter. Um, what I'd like to see is over a series of days as you hit all phases of those, but 
that's a lot to ask when you're first starting out. So just start off easy and I'll show you where you want to go. We're going to talk writing first and then we're going to go into inquiry, collaboration, organization and reading. The first one is writing to learn. And with writing to learn is here's all of the possible possibilities that you can have. I was just in a teacher's room today. She had an incredible learning log slash graphic organizer that I certainly counted as writing to learn. Okay, it doesn't always have to be notes. And I wanna make that very clear. I am gonna focus on the note taking because I wanna see, I wanna show you where this all goes um, with these five categories. This is what I call notes on fancy paper and actual Cornell notes. Before I got into Avid, I have to be honest with you, these were my notes on the left side. Okay, and I wouldn't even call it fancy paper, but that's how the kids took notes. Um, after my first year in AVID, I learned I'm going to have to change that up. And I have now moved into this realm. Now, obviously, this is a high school kid, probably a senior, junior, senior high school kid. Um, at the freshman level, I would be able to get this all done by the end of the year. It didn't happen at the start of the year, but we worked our way through this writing process using focus notes. By the end of the year, my students would have three uh, questions off to the side here about these notes here. They would have a summary. They would have gone back and actually highlighted, annotated their notes. I also required a visual picture for each page of the notes so that the kids are using a little bit more creativity with their notes as well. Some of them got really in depth and they took a lot of pride in it. Some were stick figures, but I understood what they were trying to say and I gave them credit for that. Uh, the summaries, I'd always find some collaborative ways so that the kids were sharing out their summaries with one another or groups or some sort of aspect to that. And then the notes were usually devised in some sort of collaborative effort. And I have some games and fun things I do with the kids when they're learning how to do um, the questions for their Cornell notes. So I wanna show you, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm totally honest with you. This is what it looked like before Avid. This is what it's looking like now. I improved greatly in that area for sure. So think about how you do your notes and how can you go from August, whoops, August to May in this form or another, whether it be two column, three column, however you wanna uh, go about it. Inquiry. Inquiry again is something that we don't really think about doing all the time with kids, but do they need to be thinking about questions? Sure they do. And um, that, that proves to be a critical thinker. It gives them something to, to problem solve with, something to analyze and something to process. Everything when it comes to inquiry has something to do with the students developing the questions, not so much the teacher telling them the questions, okay? And so that's really key in all this. Whenever you're having students analyze information or students formulating questions, that falls under the inquiry. If a student is doing a lab in science or they're doing a simulation, that could should be leading into a lot of inquiry and problem solving uh, learning. One of the things I want you to be aware of is that we use the levels of questioning and thinking through COSTAS. Um, I make my kids use the academic language that is associated with COSTAS levels of questioning and thinking. Okay. Um, they do not get to use who, what, why, when, where, who, did, when, is, could, those types of scenarios. That's great in the elementary schools and lower middle schools, but by the time they get to high school, they need to be using these types of questions to spur more creative thought. And so when we go, when we looked at the levels of questioning over here in the Cornell Fancy Notes, this is what I would require them. Now, if you look at this particular example, they're using the who, what, why, hows, all that. I typically don't do it that way, but I understand that it's, a lot of kids, it's hard to break that habit, but I try to break that habit with them over the course of the year, okay? So when we look at questions too, you go, well, how else can I infuse questioning? Give them 
a topic and let them explore what is a level one question. How, let them try to figure out how do I put a level two into that topic? And finally, how do I manage a level three within that topic? I gave you a really quick example here, locate Disneyland on a map. That's a level one. You can point right to the answer. Requires no brain power for the most part, but it's foundational that you need to be able to locate Disneyland if you want to go. But a level two question is compare and contrast Disneyland with Disney World. Here, we are comparing and contrasting, or we're processing that information, we're analyzing that information with information that we have, or we gained, and also with our brains a little bit too. So it's kind of both text implicit and text explicit. Finally, a level three, evaluate which of the two Disney parks is better. And here's the key word, explain. In this, they you've, they've used all their foundational vocabulary, they've processed the information, and now they are making a judgment or an evaluation on that. And this proves to be very beneficial for kids, especially dealing with a big topic, let's say photosynthesis, or you could say the Civil War, or you could say Nixon's resignation, or, or uh, a novel that you're reading. You can devise those questions and tell the kids to do this. And then you can have their kids share out with them and see how many kids know the answer to their level one question. Or how would their level three question be answered by a different student than themselves uh, trying to answer that question. So there's a lot of ways you can do this. I do a lot of question hierarchies with my, my classes as well, um, routinely, um, once or twice a week. The third part of this is collaboration. Uh, prior to COVID, there was a lot of great collaboration going on in this country in education. COVID certainly killed that, and now we're trying to regain our footing with the collaboration. Um, a lot of teachers think collaborations are the, the only the big pieces of collaboration, like a Socratic seminar or a jigsaw or philosophical chairs. And those are great. And yes, we want to keep doing those, but there's other ways we can also put collaboration to work that isn't quite so extensive or time consuming for teachers. One of the things I'm gonna focus about in, in this PD right here is the engaged rigorous academic discourse referring to a text, getting student movement within a partner ob objective with all of this and clock buddies, besties, seasons, soulmates, those types of things. I'm gonna to try to tie all three of these together. So that I'm not going to do Socratic seminars or anything like that, but just something quick you can do in your class that kind of breaks up some of the monotony and increases your rigor, your student engagement and relational capacity with your students. A lot of people call this clock buddies, season partners or pen pals. Um, I here are some examples of my to I, this is my history homies where the kids will have to pick their partners. And then once they pick their partners, I put them in various task-oriented groups over the nine-week quarter, and then I switch up their partners again. Kids get to choose their partners um, through this process as well, which they like. And, you know, typically their friends are one or two, and then people they don't know that well are down here with New York City and St. Louis. But um, I try to mix it up so that they're bouncing ideas off different types of kids. Um, this is a clock buddy. To me, this is way too complicated. Um, I like things a little bit more simple. Asking kids to get 12 partners is a lot to ask. Um, I'd like to say I try to switch it up every quarter um, and get their partners that way than having to have 12 of them and all that. If you notice here, there's a couple numbers at the top. I also put a number on there so that the kids, let's say I want to have a philosophical chairs discussion. I say odds over here, evens over there. Or if I want to put them in a jigsaw, I can go one through four over here, five through eight over there, nine through 12 over there, so forth, or one through three, or however I want to do it. Or maybe I just don't want to put them in their partners. I'll say, okay, find an even partner. Okay. Um, again, mixing my classroom up, keeping it fresh. Um, for those things. This was my uh, college colleagues out of my avid class um, when I did that. The way I do this is let's say I, I want the kids to put go into partnership. Okay. So I say, okay, everybody 
point to your ego partner. And so I will make sure every kid's pointing, okay? And then I'll notice a kid uh, not pointing. I go, well, how come you're not pointing? Well, my partner isn't here. I said, okay, who else's partner is not here? Raise your hand. So three or four kids raise their hand. I just quickly get them into their partnership and then they're off and running. If you only have that one kid that their partner is gone, guess what? You get to be the partner today. That's not a bad thing. That is building relational capacity with your students, okay? So um, that's how I do clock buddies, season partners, pen and pals, however you want to look at it. Um, I would like to see more of this done in the high school. I did this with my seniors. They like it, okay? Um, I get some teachers say they won't go for it. Yeah, they will. Um, you have to explain it to them and what they're expected and all the uh, expectations that you have for them. And believe me, they will come around uh, to those types of ideas. Let's talk quickly about organization. Organization is one of the tougher ones because a lot of teachers don't use planners or things like that. But organization doesn't have to be strictly planners. It can be the use of graphic organizers or focus notes in some sort, or you can have grade checks within your class. It can be just your class or it can be other classes as well. I'm going to share a couple of different types of things that I did to hit organization on a routine basis in my classrooms. One, you can have a like a, a binder, which is great. I just saw a great binder um, that a teacher uses a couple of days ago. So that's one way you can do it. But I'm going to focus on the grade check and how do we make the grade check beneficial to the students. This is what I call the two week before the end of quarter checkup. Okay. I have the kids write down all of their classes. And with that, they're going to go on Skyward, put the percentage, their letter grade, and their GPA points associated with this. Then as I look at their class, what can be made up or retaken or turned in so that they might go from this grade over here to a hope grade over here with associated with their hope grade points. And they do this through the whole process. Now, I've done this. I have done this with sixth graders on up. OK, and it's really important for students to understand what GPA points are all about. OK, and understanding that, hey, you can make a difference in the last two weeks, scramble, try to get some things done. It's human nature to procrastinate to some degree. Um, and this gives the kids a little bit of focus. And hopefully we can go from an overall GPA, let's say of a 2.3 here to a 2.9 or 3.0 over here. And what that does is it really gives the kids an organizational factor of how do I improve through this? Now, to be honest with you, you can give it at the beginning of the quarter as well, um, which I've done is to, to show the kids you got to stay on top of things as well. So this is an excellent form. I get a lot of teachers asking me for this particular one because it goes through and it really gets the kids focused on what they need to do to raise their grade. Here's an, a binder check. Uh, this is coming directly from Glacier Hills. This is something that we've created for them. They are fifth grade teachers, have a little bit of a binder check. Um, and again, it's not graded real strictly, but it gives the kids an idea of what organization, organization is all about at that particular level. Okay, so we really only have four subject areas of this. You gotta have your tabs. You got some you know, materials. Um, do they have proof of notes that they've done or reading materials? Um, and the binders in working condition, that's really the key factor with this. And we also don't like lo no loose paper, so we give them the shake test. So that's what an elementary binder check might look like. A secondary binder check looks much more rigorous. You gotta have all of the tabs and the tabs are in math, English, social study or science history. Um, in some order, first through eighth, I don't really care, but as long as they're in order in this organization and the kids can uh, find their information. Also, we need the organization aspect of a calendar of I can statements or starters, however you wanna look at that. 
And then again, we kind of have a shake test to make sure there are no loose papers and everything is in its place. Reading to learn. Reading to learn is kind of tricky. Sometimes if you just look at re have kids read, is that actual reading? We don't know if they're reading and C-test really doesn't count it. For our purposes, reading to learn has to be in one of these modes, okay? If they're annotating, which a lot of teachers do, that's reading to learn. Everybody's doing that, okay? How you do your annotation is up to you. I'll show you an example of what I do here in a, a few moments. Closed readings, meaning multiple reads with a purpose, okay? This is more of the complicated, rigorous type of readings that we need students to be doing at all grade levels, okay? Um, are they interacting with the text? Is is there Are there notes? Are they, they uh, annotating the text in their notes even? Okay, those types of things. Avid Weekly is available for any teacher that is uh, in the Jordan feeder. I strongly suggest you, if you haven't been on it and you don't know how to do it, call me. I will get you set up. I will set an appointment so you can use Avid Weekly. It's basically reading with all wicker in it and it's already done for you. You don't have to think a whole lot. And um, it's very engaging reading that the kids enjoy and want to read about and discuss. And it incorporates all of the wicker uh, standards with that, okay? We are, I'm just gonna quickly go over my annotation with you. Um, I think most teachers do this as very common, but again, we're intentionally using this. One of the things that I tell the kids when we're annotating is I, I tend to stay down here. I want you guys to have test questions. I want you to be thinking with your inquiry. Almost every test or every uh, reading that I give the kids, article-wise, I require a level one, a level two, and a level three question at the end of the article so that they're thinking about what the article is all about. Um, I also use this star for discussion points, okay? Why did you write that star down? Either you can write it, we can have class discussion, share with your partner, with your clock buddy, however that may look for you is up to you. So if you need some guidance with annotating the text, please reach out to me and I'd be more than happy uh, to help you out in any way possible. At the end of the day, I think it's really important that there is a focus on rigor with wicker. You can have wicker light and not get all that in depth and go in the DOKs and all that. But to be truthful with you, we want the rigor, okay? And this is a quote that came from the AVID uh, founder. Um, her name is Mary Catherine Swanson. Rigor without support is a prescription for failure. But the part two of this, support without rigor is a tragic waste of potential. And finding that balance is really difficult as a teacher. And I do believe Wicker helps you with that. I think Wicker really puts the supports that Rigor needs, but also allows the kids that opportunity not to be a tragic waste, that they can now meet that Rigor, rigor standard um, in this process. And so I really like that quote. Every PD I do is always about rigor of some sorts and how we can keep challenging kids, um, but we need to challenge them with that support in mind. In review, try giving your lessons an avid twist. I, I really think it just a little bit goes a long way. And if you're in the Jordan feeder, if the kids do it in sixth grade, there's nothing wrong with them doing the same thing in seventh grade with clock buddies or whatever. I think it actually improves and we can build upon more rigorous um, coursework with them when they know what they're doing all the way from sixth to 12th grade. Number two, hopefully you can start your worker lessons for next year. Start thinking about how do I infuse my clock buddies or my pen of pals, or how do I infuse inquiry into my lessons on a daily basis? And really infusing inquiry is probably one of the easiest things you can do because have the kids write questions. There you go. They're processing information and they're analyzing it. And so trying to find things that happen for next year is really key. Um, I've done in the past exit 
tickets with the students um, to leave my classroom for inquiry, just so you know. Try implementing four to five wicker strategy, strategies in each lesson. If you need a copy of the wicker walkthrough, I'll give it to you. And you can kind of go through your lessons, go boom, I do this, this, and this. How do I infuse this aspect just to give it a little bit more of a twist, okay? Um, try a one pager. I, I That was at the beginning of this PD. Love one pagers. Try it out. See what happens. You can do it with anything. You can do it with even a personal thing um, like I did with you guys. Um, but try one pagers. Kids love them, and I think you'll like them as well. And finally, if you need anything Avid, Wicker, or Wiser, please reach out to me. I'm more than willing to share whatever I have or bounce ideas off me or bounce ideas off you. It, However you want to do it. My number is 801-815-5791 or contact me at my email, which is j.rudell at canyonsdistrict.org. Well, I hope you got something out of this. I hope we gave some ideas. I enjoyed being a being a guest speaker on the Bite Size PD. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Hope to hear from you soon. So take care and have a great day.